When Mike and I are listening to our own show, we love to chime in to some of our favorite hosts in the true crime unexplained genre. That's right. We're talking about the Chime In podcast. Graham, Sarah, and Michaela explore topics including the unexplained, true crime, missing persons, and much, much more. Their show has included distinguished guests such as U.S. Marshals, Darren Sharper of the Cooper Vortex, and Chris Williamson of Vanished and Chasing Earhart. But wait, there's more. To make it more fun, each episode has trivia questions to include the audience. Mike and I have been enjoying the Chime In podcast since 2018, and now we want to share it with you. You can download and subscribe to the Chime In podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. Find them on Twitter at Chime In Podcast, also Instagram at Chime In dot pod, and Facebook as Chime In Podcast. That's C H I M E I N Podcast. They're big supporters of Locations Unknown, and we hope that our friends enjoy their show as much as we do. Thousands of people have mysteriously vanished in America's wilderness. Join us as we dive into the deep end of the unexplainable and try to piece together what happened. You are listening to Locations Unknown. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Locations Unknown. I'm your co-host, Joe Erado, and with me, as always, is a guy who hits harder than a bison goring a tourist at Yellowstone, Mike <laughs> Van de Bogart. Uh, thank you, Joe, and thank you once again to all of our loyal listeners for tuning in. Hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving. It was nice to have a couple days off, extra long weekend. Uh, just a couple quick updates here before we get going. We've we've got some new Patreon shoutouts for this episode. All right, they they heard our plea. They heard our plea, <laughs> and we won't be homeless for another two weeks. <laughs> so, um, thank you to Elise Rucker, J V Williams, Amanda Swanson, Michelle Dove, and Jesse Swanson Samson <laughs> Samsonite Slippy Slappy yeah. Swanny. I knew it started with an S. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, Jesse uh, Masculier. I probably really butchered that one. <laughs> Mask Lear? How do you how would you say that? Um I'll um I don't have the uh pronunciation machine pulled up yet, but you can keep going and I'm gonna oh. look that up. <laughs> uh and we also have a uh, episode suggestion shout out to Christine Hamra or Hamre again, I'm butchering the name. Uh so Joe will wanna check that one Masculier. out too. Masculier. 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 I think I was pretty it's close. It's like it's French. Um, so thank you, Christine, for suggesting this episode. This is a really interesting episode. Uh, I had never heard of it actually. Um, but so we're excited to cover this. Um, you want to call the show? We actually got a really funny voicemail about a a supposed encounter with one of us in a Walmart. Maybe (laughs) we'll get to that on a Patreon episode in the future, but thank you for, it's uh, a doozy. It had me like crying laughing. Yeah, it's it's really funny. So more of those if you want to want us to comment on them, but uh and you'd have to join Patreon to hear that. But uh you can always call the show at 208-391-6913. We love hearing from you. Uh any any feedback, uh funny comments, stories, you hate us and want us to hear your voice and hear the hate in your voice. <laughs> uh call that number. Um so we are also, uh, if you want to help support the show besides buying some of our merch, which you can find on our website store or on Facebook, uh, you can also go to Patreon, like we've been mentioning. We have YouTube memberships, and we have a premium subscription on Apple. So check that out. Lots of ways to help support the show. And if you don't want to help monetarily, but you like the show, just tell all of your family and friends about it and try to you know, set a goal of telling 15 people a day about the show. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, the word will slowly get out there. If we have all of our listeners that currently listen to 15 people a day, we'll be bigger than Joe Rogan by next week. Yeah. <laughs> so there is your homework. for Gorilla the, marketing. Yeah, homework for the next episode. <laughs> uh, so any updates from you, Joe? 
Now that's it. All right, everybody, let's gear up and get out to explore locations unknown. July 2nd, 2020. Hikers in the Sierra National Forest discovered an abandoned campsite with gear strewn about near Johnson Meadows. Days later, hikers near that area reported seeing a bruised and barefoot woman on the trail who refused help when offered. Over a month after the initial campsite was discovered, the same woman was seen by hunters off a remote road in the forest. Join us this week as we investigate the bizarre disappearance of Sandra Johnson Hughes. So our story takes place in the Sierra National Forest. Uh, the sublocation is Johnson Meadows. Uh, Sierra, Sierra National Forest is 1.3 million acres, which is slightly smaller than the state of Delaware. So it's a pretty big area. Yeah, it's a big forest. And it's like in the middle of like tons of national parks and other forests. It's Yeah, it says it's uh, located in the western, western slope of the central Sierra Nevada. It's known for spectacular mountain scenery and abundant, abundant natural resources. I'm having a rough night already. <laughs> um, so what I'll do is I'll throw this up for our people viewing. Yes. No, I didn't even search it. We're still in Hawaii from uh, your Cal El hike. So or, for those of you who only listen to the show, we, we also do a live stream of this. Uh, not live live, but the video will go up on YouTube and we, we it's live show, to us. It's live to us. <laughs> um, and we show, you know, maps of the locations, pictures from the search, other relevant yeah. things that happen. So it's a little Southeast of San Francisco to give you an idea uh, where this is located. So the forest shares borders with Yosemite national park, the Inyo national forest, Kings Canyon national park and Sequoia national forest. Johnson Meadows is a very beautiful but isolated part of the Sierra National Forest, not a normal destination for casual hikers. So, as we said, it's in California. It was established in 1893 and sees roughly uh, a million visitors a year. It's like a million 50,000. So, a million mm -hmm. visitors a year. That's a 2017's USDA report. Um, so, a history of the area. The Sierra National Forest has been home to Native American people for at least 13,500 years. This date is based on obsidian hydration analysis of Clovis Point, of a Clovis Point that was discovered in the upper reaches of Kings River watershed, a little above 8,000 feet in elevation. Clovis refers to a projectile point type as well as a culture, as well as the culture that produced them. So the Clovis people were originally thought as the like original people of the North so, Americas. Uh, but I've been watching yeah, I was Graham gonna, Hancock yeah. and special on Netflix, and yeah. I think there is very good archaeological <laughs> evidence that they were not the first people. Yeah, but, it's uh, I'm only like a half half away halfway into that episode. But I, I saw how excited you were getting yeah, when I, I said gonna, that. You beat me to the punch. Um, very interesting documentary and uh, he had a, a podcast he was on rogan's podcast a while back and with uh the other guy i can't remember his name well it's 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 graham hancock and alan yeah i don't remember his first name but his it's interesting name, i yeah. obviously joe and i have no idea what we're talking I about i geek out on that to, stuff you know archaeology and it makes sense it's to interesting me. it makes sense to me which um, isn't a lot but <laughs> but if it makes sense, it makes sense to me at least. But uh, this is the accepted uh, history of the area as of, as we know it today, yep. which maybe it'll change someday. Yep. Hey, they <laughs> just in the last ten years discovered William Shakespeare wasn't one person. <laughs> what, it was. What? You didn't know this? Uh, maybe I did. I don't. Hey, know. You look it up. William Shakespeare was like a conglomerate of different writers that wrote as the pen name William Shakespeare. Oh. It's like a group of people. Wow. So yeah, th things change all the time as we learn more. Wow. Uh, so these early inhabitants. So right now we're going off of the uh, the the current accepted Clovis people were the first ones there. The early inhabitants. So they're commonly referred to as pal Paleo Indian, a term which simply refers to as early Indian and encompasses a period of time from 14,000 to 10,000 years ago. Uh, 
So here are some interesting facts about the forest. No, these are, this is just forests. Oh, forests in general. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry. No, we did one on National Forests in a different episode, and I didn't want to get the comments. Oh, that we people get so mad if they have to hear the same fact twice. We're just recycling. Yeah, content. so here we go. Yeah. Which, to be fair, sometimes people only listen to the new episodes. If they're new listeners, they don't go all the way back. So and some of the reviews we of get, I, I feel like they're probably listening to an episode from like two or three years ago. Yeah. And then they base the review on, like, come back to us. Yeah. Check out some newer stuff. That's okay. We don't like those people. <laughs> uh, there's an ancient old growth forest uh, bordering Poland called Bielowatza Forest. If I got that right, I'm going to type that in. Bielowatza. That's what I'm calling that. Let's see. But it's Wiza. Bielowiza. Biel- oh, I have a piece of schmutz on my computer that is making it look weird. <laughs> Bielowiza. Bielowiza. All right. I have to go back to my thing. Forest. It resembles what most of Europe looked like before the 14th century. Uh, a man called Jadav Ping single-handedly planted a forest bigger than Central Park to save the Muli Islands in northern India from erosion. The forest is now home to large amounts of stray wildlife. One of the reasons your lungs feel refreshed when walking through a pine forest is because of an anti-inflammatory compound called a pinene found in conifers. It is used as a bronchiodilator in the treatment of asthma and abundantly present in marijuana. Peter Mayhew, uh, quote, uh, Chewbacca. He's the actor who played. He's the actor. He's the Chewbacca. tall, tall yeah. dude. Was required, required to be accompanied by crew members who wore brightly colored vests while in the forest of the Pacific Northwest filming scene set on Endor so as to not be mistaken for Bigfoot and shot. <laughs> I, I, told, I was laughing when I read that. <laughs> that would be, that makes perfect sense that that would happen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there is a tree named Pando that is technically an entire forest. It is a... Uh, colonial uh, colonial colony of 4,700 aspens in Utah that all share the same root system. I remember reading about that in science class in yeah. high school. Uh, the New Jersey Forest Fire Service can summon any person aged 18 to 50 in their jurisdiction to help fight a wild for- fire or for use of their property in assisting, and it is a crime to refuse. The duties assigned require minimal training such as digging trenches. Uh, Hurricane Katrina uncovered an underwater forest off the Alabama coast that is 50,000 years old. Uh, There is a 2,400-year-old giant honey mushroom in Oregon covering 2,200 acres, slowly killing off the trees in the forest. It is the largest living organism on the planet. So are they like just letting it go and watching it? Or I, I watched a documentary on a fung- fungus, and I remember them talking about this. It's it's crazy. It, it's like covers, you know what, they, 2,200 acres, and they consider it a single organism. That's wild. Yeah. Uh, forest growth in the U.S. has exceeded harvest since the 1940s, and the USA has more trees now than any time in its past 100 years. That's good to know. Yeah. Breathe a little easier. <laughs> uh, charcoal beetles fly into still burning forest fires to mate and lay eggs because competition and predators will be low. They sense distant fires using infrared armpit sensors. <laughs> that's crazy. You know, someone dedicated their life to the charcoal beetle. Probably. And that's where we get this information from. They're just like, you know what? I'm going to do just charcoal beetles for the rest of my life. <laughs> that's, that's all they're I doing. I mean, somebody probably. I'm not making fun of them. I'm saying that's great. There's probably a charcoal beetle PhD expert out there. Good. We need specialization. That's why we get cool stuff. <laughs> yeah. The western portions, uh, this one's going to, we're now diving into the climate of Sierra Nevadas. So the western portions of the Sierra, Sierra Nevada region is characterized by a Mediterranean climate with cool, wet winters and warm, dry summers. The western portion of the Sierra Nevadas receives moisture and warm air from prevailing westerly winds off the North Pacific Ocean. And as air moves upward over the mountain range, air cools and moisture condenses into clouds and precipitation. Think Thus, of it like wringing out a... a- Rag, yeah, full of water. It balls up in the mountains and just whoosh, dumps out. That's a good uh, analogy. I like that. <clears throat> Thus, the western mountainous portion of the Sierra Nevadas receives much more precipitation than the eastern portion elevations between 5,000 and 6,000 feet on the west slope. And there's some of the wettest in the region. 
Now, the Sierra National Forest enjoys warm summer Mediterranean climate in accordance with our friends over at the Copen Cla- Geiger classification I, system. I switched it up there on you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's a completely different building on the same campus, though. Yeah. <laughs> the yearly average maximum temperature in Sierra Net- National Forest is 58 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, ranging from 41 degrees Fahrenheit in February to 81 degrees Fahrenheit in July. Annual rainfall is 43.5 inches with a minimum of... 0.6 inches in August and a max of 9.1 in January. So the best months for good weather in the Sierra National Forest are June, July, August, and September. On average, the warmest months are July and August. The coldest months are February and December. And January is the rainiest month. So some of the terrain here. Uh, it includes rolling oak-covered foothills, heavily forested middle elevation slopes, and starkly beautiful alpine landscapes of the high Sierras. The elevations range from 900 feet to over 13,992 feet. Wow, just short of a 14er, huh? Yeah. Uh, the highest peaks include Mount Humphreys at 13,992 and Mount Gab at 13,747. I would just go get like a 10-foot ladder and right. St- right in the top of the mountain. And then yeah, just, 14. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> or stack a bunch of rocks. Exactly. Uh, Bear Creek Spire at 13,726 and Red Slate Mountain at 13,000. Uh, 13,140. Uh, some of the animals that you might run into are mule deer, black bears, coyotes, bobcats, fox, California mountain king snake, the western rattlesnake, mountain lions, marmots, porcupines, and quail. No grizzlies, I think. No, no. <laughs> no, we know there's no yeah, grizzlies. Yeah, you have to put that asterisk right there right away. Uh, so sudden changes in weather uh, can catch... Many people unaware, drenching thunderstorms can form in a matter of hours, and snow can fall at any time of the year. So you always want to be prepared for all weather conditions. Thunderstorms are frequent and a spectacular occurrence in the mountains. These summer storms often bring intense rain, hail, and lightning strikes, particularly in the mid to late afternoon, but can occur at any time, is when they always say, get off the summits by noon. Yeah. Uh, plan to be over passes and away from high open areas by noon. <laughs> During a storm, stay away from peaks, ridges, Caves, water, open areas, seek shelter. So don't be anywhere. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you would think like, oh, I'd take shelter in a cave, but a cave could fill up with water. Oh, yeah, you don't want to be there. In a heavy rain. Well, it, even if it doesn't fill up and water's rushing, it can push you back into it. And yeah. Just no good things. That's what happened in Zion. Yeah. Uh, by setting up camp in a safe location before lightning begins, you can enjoy the power and spectacle of mountain thunderstorms without apprehension. They are cool. Yeah. Good thunderstorm in the mountains is, is the most beautiful thing ever. It is kind of terrifying, though, too. It's extremely terrifying. When you, you hear that clap of thunder off in the distance, you're like, up, oh, time to get moving. Yeah, when you look around <laughs> above a tree line and you're like, well, there's zero cover. I have to get somewhere fast. <laughs> yeah. uh, high water. So during spring and early summer, runoff from melting snow causes high water levels and swift currents in rivers and streams. We said this a million times. Do not ford rivers if you do not know what you're doing and have stuff strapped to your body. Uh, please remember that unabridged streams crossings may be hazardous. Cross in wide, shallow spot that is not above rapids or falls. Unbuckle your waist straps. Use long sticks for stability and face upstream while crossing. Uh, never tie yourself to safety ropes. They can drown you. Water is very cold, so use caution uh, in those conditions because you can lead to hypothermia very easily, even on a sunny day if the water yep. is cold enough. Um, during or immediately following heavy rain events, water can rise rapidly. So use extra caution when these conditions are present. So it could be a small stream, but if it's raining, all of a sudden it can become a big swift current and take you away. Yeah. So let's talk about mountain lions. Mountain lions are shy and rarely seen, but they live throughout the area. You want to watch children closely and never let them run ahead or lag behind on a trail. Talk to children about lions and teach them what to do if they meet one. Never approach a mountain lion. And do not run, but hold your ground and back away slowly. Face the lion and stand upright. Do all you can, can to appear larger. Grab sticks. Raise your arms. If you have small children with you, pick them up. If the lion behaves aggressively, wave your arms, shout, and throw objects at it. The goal is to convince that you are not prey and that you may be dangerous yourself, and they will back off. That's a big thing. You want to keep children in between you. If you have two adults, they should be bookends. Mm-hmm. Keep the kids in the middle. Um. Other dangers include early season snow, tick-borne diseases, and giardia. You want to yep. get you know, don't don't want to get that. Drink clean <laughs> no. water. Um, so some tips to keep you safe: let someone know your itinerary, instruct them to contact emergency now, personnel if you are overdue. I know we kind of cover this stuff every episode, but I think it's just important to hammer home the safety tips. 
uh, just so I people... I think we've been saying it long enough. That we may have staved off a couple missing pe- people by now. That would be really cool, and I think uh, we'll I don't probably... Think we'd ever know. Yeah, we'll never know. Um, but I think just... We want to say it enough that if you listen to the show every week and you're out hiking, you just like will think of these things. And, oh crap, Joe and Mike said I better tell someone where I am. <laughs> yeah, and like, then do it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, message us. Let us know where you are. Yeah, call our voicemail. Tell yep. us. Call the voicemail. Where put it on our face. Yeah, tell the whole community on Facebook. That'd actually be a cool Facebook trend. Is everyone just lets everybody know where they're at? Yeah, all the time, unless that. You don't want people knowing where you're at? Yeah, like then you're, you, people know your like, house is empty. And yeah. So maybe maybe don't do that, but tell loved ones where you're there, going. There you go, at a minimum. <laughs> yeah. Or us. You yeah. can DM us. Yeah. Um, so stay on the trail. In addition to causing severe erosion and damage, leave no trace, hiking off trails increases the potential for injury and becoming lost because they might not look for you off trail. Yeah. When hiking with a group, tr- keep track of each other and wait for at all trail junctions. Do not split up. Most of the cases, if uh, 90% of them are people by themselves or yeah. leaving the group. Yep. Always carry extra food and water and rain gear and warm clothing. If you don't plan on spending the night, assume you might have to. Yeah. That's one thing. I always carry more gear, and sometimes people who are not as savvy as Mike or I make fun of us for carrying more weight. But if we keep doing that, we should not have the problems that we talk about on a weekly basis. Yes. Uh, if you do become ill or injured on the trail and are unable to hike, send someone in your party or a passing hiker for help. Write down and give the messenger your exact location, age, gender, height, weight, and description of your illness, injury, in order to ensure the appropriate emergency response. And then you want to stay put. Yes. Don't try and get closer. Don't try and make it easier for them. Stay where you are because that's where they're going to say you were. I did a, a recently, I was on another podcast where they uh the host of the podcast had a uh, search and rescue expert in the field of like 30 years on and for about an hour we were talking about we were talking about the terry meter case but he was going into a lot of the stuff we've talked about and one of the big things is people will wander around after they're lost and it just it hurts their chances of being found quicker yeah um and sometimes is maybe the reason why they never were found. So yeah, it's uh, you know as soon as you know you're you're missing, uh, you're, you're lost. The best bet is to you know in the immediate area try to f- you know find somewhere where you can get some shelter, but don't keep wandering around. Yeah. Um. If you if you you really think you're yeah, lost. odds are you're going to become more lost. Mm-hmm. And if you do become disoriented. Disoriented. disoriented yes <laughs> or lost sorry mike i had to uh attempt to fix your location using a map compass and landmarks if you're unable to locate the trail stay put use a mirror reflective object to signal for help any signal done three times in a series is a universal distress call uh that's important to always bring a map with you yeah like anytime we go hiking we get those those waterproof tearproof maps and it's just good to have and, and you can track your trail location, always check up where you I've are. I've said it a bunch of times, you know, a, a GPS can get broken, run out of batteries. A map can even get wet, torn. You can, you know, a compass really doesn't break. Yeah. And, you know, just go buy a compass and learn the basics of how, you know, go to your, uh, go to your local park and just practice navigating via yeah, your compass. There's tons of uh, material on YouTube and, and they'll teach you how to read maps and compasses. Yeah. And I mean, if you have a compass and a map you know, you're, you're already ahead of the game from a lot of people that get lost. Yeah. There's many times we've gone bushwhacking, but with a map and a compass, we don't get lost. Yeah. You know exactly where you are all times and it doesn't matter. <clears throat> so difficulty in general, uh, the Sierra national forest spans all seasons. People visit the forest for camping, horseback riding, swimming, picnicking, biking, pretty much all the stuff you do. Yeah. Um, in the wildlife. So based on all trails, similar to other parks we've covered, Sierra national forest has trails to accommodate every skill level. Um, all trails list over 124 top trails in the forest with 30 listed as easy, 60 listed as moderate and 34 listed as hard. So, uh, let's talk about Sandra. Yeah. So, uh, like we said, her name is Sandra Johnson Hughes. She was born July 26th, 1966. Uh, she was officially reported, I believe, or her last known sighting was on, July 4th, I believe she might have, we'll get into the timeline, she might have been, the official missing persons report might have been uh, submitted a day or two early, but July 4th was the last date anyone um, saw her. There's some other, we'll get into the timeline, there's some other sightings where people may have seen her, but uh, the July 4th sighting is kind of confirmed. 
Uh, she was a female, age 54. Her height was 5 foot 3 inches, 150 pounds. She had brown hair, but uh, her hair may have been dyed blue at the time of her disappearance. She had brown eyes. Uh, clothing gear last seen in. It's unknown uh, what she may have had, but she was kind of she was camping out in a remote area of the forest, and it, it sounds like her campsite had a lot of gear in it. So she, you said it, it was in John. That's actually really cool. Look at Johnson Meadows. All yeah. this forest and trees is this one little spot yeah. of just pure meadow, and you can see a trail. It looks like coming. Yeah, right here. Oh, you got tire tracks going there. So. Yeah, there's little roads or trails. Yeah, it's a very remote section of the forest. Like I, like Joe mentioned in the beginning, it's not somewhere that probably your casual hiker is going to go. But um, oh, yeah, like, I'm I'm not finding any major roads. No, I, I think how far you zoomed get, out I am. Yeah, you get to it by some pretty like rough. Um, yeah, that's like forest dirt, roads. That's dirt road going all the way in. Yeah, and uh, so you know, Sandra was actually trained in. Um, wilderness survival. So she wasn't just, you know, some slouch All right, out in the woods. So not your run of the mill hiker. She knew what she was doing. Yeah. She had the training, um, based on her campsite, she had the gear necessary to survive out there for a while. Um, she was, su she was seen in various outfits throughout the timeline. So we'll get into kind of what she was seen in. Um, her family and friends describe her as a very independent woman who, was is not the person to like ask for help or take assistance like she wanted to do it herself but they said that doesn't mean that if she was in serious tr serious trouble or had a serious injury that she wouldn't refuse help cuz there were some people on the internet that had speculated that you know she a couple times she was offered assistance and refused mm -hmm. and they said in a normal state of mind if she was hurt she would have not have done that um yeah. She was married in the past, but did not have any kids. Uh, many in her close circle of family and friends said she kind of lived a nomad lifestyle, living all over the country throughout her life. She had most recently lived in Maui, Hawaii, and then uh, right before her disappearance, actually moved to um, this area of California. Uh, okay. So, so she might have been new to this area, but still had the the skills to survive. Yeah. New to the area, city. but yeah, she was trained in wilderness survival, medical issues, none that we could find in our research, her occupation. <laughs> so her day job was actually an accountant, but she, like you, ha, yeah. But she studied a uh, wilderness survival in college because she actually in college, she wanted to become a park ranger, but uh, that didn't turn out. So uh, I would say all around um, based on everything I read, she, uh, you know, a, a strong independent woman that liked to kind of move around and, you know, experience new things and, um, trained in wilderness survival. So, uh, you know, not your typical person that would go missing. Um, so before we get in the timeline, Joe ha is going to say a word from our sponsor for this episode. When Mike and I aren't listening to our own show, we love to chime in to some of our favorite hosts in the true crime, unexplained genre. That's right. We're talking about the Chime In podcast. Graham, Sarah, and Michaela explore topics including the unexplained, true crime, missing persons, and much, much more. Their show has included distinguished guests such as U.S. Marshals, Darren Sharper of the Cooper Vortex, and Chris Williamson of Vanished and Chasing Air Hype. But wait, there's more. To make it more fun, each episode has trivia questions to include the audience. Mike and I have been enjoying the Chime In Podcast since 2018, and now we want to share it with you. You can download and subscribe to the Chime In Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. Find them on Twitter at Chime In Podcast, also Instagram at chimein.pod, and Facebook as the Chime In Podcast. That's C-H-I-M-E-I-N Podcast. They're big supporters of Locations Unknown, and we hope that our friends enjoy their show as much as we do. So I'm going to jump right into the timeline. This whole story kind of starts off in June of 26, 2020. And uh, Sandra had spoken with family members and let them know that she was planning to go solo hiking and camping in the Sierra National Forest and that she was possibly going to hike all the way north to Yosemite, which um, isn't you know, it'd be a good hike, but not too far from where she would have been hiking. Yeah, I'll look it up or um, get an idea. And uh, like we said, she recently moved from Maui, Hawaii to 
Madeira, California, which is um, this region of the Sierra National that, Forest. That's pretty far. Yeah, I mean, it's... From here to there. What's the... Let's get my ruler out. As the crow flies. 30 miles 30 through the miles. mountains? That's if you could just go in a straight line. That's a straight line. and that's That's a week and a half minimum. Yeah. And it could be more. I don't know how crazy those mountains are. Yeah. Um, so, and part of the reason why she decided to do this kind of trip was, um, obviously this time, uh, 2020 June COVID was just kicking off. You know, the world was kind of shutting down. People were scared. Um, Sandra thought it would be best for her to get away and into the outdoors to kind of clear her head where she could be alone. And she said, hopefully remain healthy without the threats of the current pandemic. So, um, kind of a, a cool way to ride out a pandemic in the beginning when you don't know what's going on in the world. Like, you know what? I'm going off grid. I don't want to, Yeah, this could be the next plague. Maybe it isn't. I'm going to go out in the woods and clear my head, you know, yeah. Be away from people, be away from people. Maybe when I come back, things it's look, the end of the world. It's, <laughs> everyone's gone or it's, it's, it's normal. So it's a, it's an interesting idea. If, if you could, you can swing that. <clears throat> uh, one thing I'll note about this case was, I found a lot of conflicting dates in the media reports um, about when things happened in this case. So we have posts from family members on Facebook that have one date, and then we have news reports that report date different dates. We're not talking anything, you know, crazy off, but I'm basing my dates. You know, on- someone's going to complain about your level of research. <laughs> like, well, I saw it in the one place where it was different. Right. You clearly don't research. <laughs> like, so, yeah. you know, I listen to all of them, and that makes it harder. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm basing my dates off of uh, Madera County Sheriff's Office reports that they yeah, would. Yeah, I'd stick with the official. Yeah, and I will, I'm going to shorten that up. I'm going to refer to the Madera County Sheriff's Office as MCSO. Uh, just to speed things up. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's fast forward now. So like I said, she told family she was going to go camping on June 26th. Um, we don't know exactly when she made it to the forest, but on July 2nd of 2020, and the, like I said, this comes from an MCSO report. Uh, hikers found her camping gear and supplies abandoned and strewn about near Johnson Meadows. They contacted MCSO to report uh, the found property. After receiving the report, MCSO contacted the Hughes family, and a missing report was filed a short time after. Uh, eventually that day, MCSO officials made it out to the abandoned campsite. They noted that the campsite was also in disarray with things strewn about, bags emptied, uh, just an overall mess, but they did find enough personal belongings to identify the campsite um, as that it was Sandra's. So, and this is where I found conflicting reports on, you know, online at different news media. Some news organizations claimed that the campsite was discovered by officials on the 5th. Um, But from what I read from the actual Sheriff's Department report, it was July 2nd. Uh, Overall, it really doesn't affect the the narrative of the timeline, but um, I just want to make sure everyone is aware that <laughs> if you go out and personally search this case, you're going to find a lot of different dates. Or if you find one date and it's different than what we said, you didn't do enough research. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we are going to fast forward to, so J- July 2nd was when her abandoned campsite was found, just an absolute right, mess. So a couple hikers came across her campsite and it was things strewn about. They, they found it, they marked it on their map, they actually hiked out to cell phone reception, then called the sheriff's department, and then... They eventually got up there to officially find the campsite. Um, so now it's July 4th. This would be the last date that she was actually seen by hikers. And this comes from not only an MCSO report, but also an MPS report. So Sandra was last seen on July 4th near the Chiquito Lake Trailhead in the Sierra National Forest. And I bet Joe is going to... Chiquito. That's right, yeah. Chiquito. Chiquito. It's definitely going to be Chiquito. That one. That one's an easy one. Chiquito. Chiquito. There we go. I knew it. Uh, Sandra. How, how dare you? I know. <laughs> so she was last seen near the Chiquito Lake Trailhead in the Sierra National Forest. The hikers who saw her noted she was barefoot and had a bruise on her face. She was wearing a black shirt and blue jeans. They uh, told law enforcement that they offered her help, but she declined any assistance. 
<clears throat> now, this is a different report from the national. I'm just noting this image they took. She's barefoot, so she might like to be barefoot when she's hiking. Yeah, like maybe she's taking a break and she wants to walk around in the grass barefoot. Yeah. I mean, we've hiked. When we take a break, oh, I'll take, take my your boots shoes off, off and walk around. Get yes. my feet some air. Um, so now this report came from the National Park Service. They reported that motorists saw her walking away from a crash. So we'll get into that. Her, she, her car was crashed and that they offered her assistance, but she declined. Um, either way, depending on which sighting happened first, this would be the last time anyone really official, <clears throat> officially saw her. Um, we have some other sightings that are more sketchy, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. Uh, so we are fast forwarding now to the afternoon. So, Han, they, so if we're going by the official reports, she was seen on the 4th. Some people say they found her campsite on the 5th. But really, they said the second, so it would be like maybe two days later they saw her walking from a car crash. So what makes me think, what makes me think the July second date is correct is because the hikers that saw her on the fourth at the time didn't know she was missing. When they got back down out to the parking lot, there there already had been signs posted of Sandra that okay. like she's missing. Have you seen her? That's when they noticed they realized. She's the missing woman, and they contacted law enforcement and said we saw her. So if her campsite hadn't been found until the fifth, and then she was reported missing on the fifth, how would well the hikers have seen her on the fourth and then <laughs> seen the missing person? Flyers? Well, hold on, that could be <clears throat> she was walking away from a car crash on the fourth, and then she went to the campsite and they found it the next day. No, I mean the 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 sheriff's department statement specifically says she was seen by hikers on the fourth. Okay. So the uh all right, so okay. Yeah, so but they said that she was walking away from a car crash? Well, they said she was walking aw she crashed her car and was walking away. They didn't say oh. So maybe I should have specified. She wasn't technically maybe seen walking away from the crash, but they say motorists saw her walking away. Okay. So there's all right, it's all right. fuzzy. <laughs> but I think we can for certain say that she she was seen by hikers on the 4th because that was reported to law enforcement. Those hikers only realized it was her when they saw missing person flyers in the parking lot. Okay. So that's why I think this July 2nd Okay, yeah, that correct. makes sense. Why would those flyers be there if they didn't already if find, they the campsite found the campsite and report? Site. Okay, so yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm with you now. Yeah. So yeah. I want to make sure I asked it because if I thought of it, we have 40,000 people listening to the show. Someone yeah. else is going to think that too. Well, and you, I wanted the specific, I keep saying like the dates are different where you, depending on where you look, because people will comment and say that, oh, you got the Well, and I trust one. that report because it was multiple people and motorists called it in. So yeah. if there's missing persons flyers already, how can she be missing prior to her being missing? Yeah. So we'll post all of the uh, Madera County Sheriff's Department statements on our website in the sources section so you can go read them yourself. Um, so fast forwarding now to July 5th of 2020. It's the afternoon. This again comes from another MCSO report. Uh, later that afternoon, her silver Saab 95 was found on road 5SO4 about a mile above the Chiquito Lake Trailhead, approximately six miles north of her campsite. Uh, the MCSO investigators believe the woman's car smashed into a tree at no more than 20 miles an hour. The airbags did not deploy and then rolled down into a ravine and became stuck. There was also no reported blood inside the vehicle. Reports stated that all the items from inside the car had been thrown out of the car as if someone had rummaged through her car, similar to what happened to her campsite. They wow. also, yeah, they also got to state that at this point, Authorities didn't believe she was actively trying to evade law enforcement, but might in fact have been hurt and disorientated. And that disoriented. In <laughs> Darn it. I, it's like, I saw that coming up and I was just waiting. It's like a block in my brain. I can't yeah. say that word. Right. So, <laughs> so basically they think her injury may have impaired her judgment to the point that uh, maybe that was causing her to rummage through the car or the campsite. We'll get into theories later. Okay. Uh, so this already is very weird. It's a very strange case. Uh, that's for sure. So search officials decided to leave her car where they have found it and posted a note on the windshield, which we have uh, with instructions on what to do if she sees this and that her family really misses her. So it's this uh, one, right yeah, there, the that orange one. note. 
So that is the note that they left on her windshield. All right, this vehicle is probably... Please call Madera County Sheriff's Office if you are Sandra. Date and time is 6.30 p.m. at 7.05 of 2020. Other, your family is worried about you. And then there's a, the numbers for the Forest Service or yeah. the Sheriff's Department. Oh, that's a Forest Service. Yeah, it's a U.S. Okay. Forest Service. Okay. Um, so, yeah, they decided to leave her car there in case maybe in her you know impaired state due to an injury, maybe she wanders back to the car. She sees this bright orange note and is able to call for help. Uh, so... And again, here's where we have some little bit of issues with dates. So most me reports actually state the correct date of the car, seven five. Which yeah, the guy standing there putting it on there probably knew what seven date five. It was. So yeah. I think, but uh, family post state that it it was found on seven six. So maybe things just weren't you know in the heat of the moment. They're getting sure. some dates wrong. It's, it's not it's, that it's important. It's telephone. Yeah. So her niece Ashley Marcus actually was very active on Facebook during this uh, search and rescue. And we've got a couple statements that she posted. Uh, she wrote uh, first the campsite found in the Johnson Meadows area between Besor and Minaret roads with her belongings was quite disheveled. Things were thrown about all over, almost as if the car and belongings had been emptied carelessly. Ashley said the state of the campsite was very unusual. She would never leave her campsite a mess. Even a piece of litter on the ground would bother her. She then also posted her car was located off a of road 5S70, which actually um, c contradicts what the sheriff's department posted, but that doesn't really matter. While the initial disheveled camp was located off of road uh, 5S13, which I believe also contradicts what uh, the sheriff's department posted, but um, they thoroughly searched both areas and conducted interviews the past two days, but have not made contact with Sandra. Furthermore, they have not had any additional reported sightings. Please keep looking if you are in the area and report anything to the Madera County Sheriff's Office, Forest Service, or myself. Oh, and I think you found... And you have Ashley's uh, Facebook post. Yeah, so... From, uh, from August 13th, so it was an update later. Yeah, so you got a couple posts there. Yep. Um, so, like we said, when her car was found, uh, searchers decided to... They actually started searching the area around where the car was found. Obviously, when the campsite was found, they, did, they conducted a search around Johnson Meadows, didn't find anything... When her car was found, and Joe actually has a map of the different points, and this will reveal some of the stuff coming up. But um, So each time something was found or there was a sighting, they did a search of that area, and every time didn't find anything, no evidence that she was there. Yeah, this is a big, I mean, first camp here, moving all the way up. So the, like we said, the car was about six miles north of the campsite mm -hmm. per the sheriff's office. And then we'll get into some of the other items that were found, but she it seems like she was going north. Yeah. So um, we have an update from the Sheriff's Department on July 8th of 2020. MCSO Corporal Chris Williams organized and is leading the search and rescue in the Sierra National Forest for Hughes, who went missing while camping alone. Deputies and volunteers, volunteers from Kern County Sheriff, Tulare County Sheriff, and Fresno County Sheriff came to help along with Cal OES and our own search and rescue team. California Air National Guard is also assisting with aerial searches. So uh, it's a pretty large search operation. We've got pictures. I believe this is an actual site or picture from the sleeping bag, it looks like. Yeah. Did we get to that yet? No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but Joe actually does have some pictures of, like, the search team um, doing their work, kind of behind the scenes uh, stuff going on. They're looking, this is a, they're it, looking at a map. A giant iPad. Yeah, yeah. Hold on, um, yeah, this looks like a like probably in the morning or a shift change. They're kind of like yeah, debriefing the next group to go debriefing out. or briefing or who knows. But yeah, uh, you know, pretty massive operation. They were out there for a couple weeks. Um, so we're moving on to uh, July twelfth of twenty twenty. So we have a sheriff's department update and a family update. So first from the sheriff's department. Uh, we may have many figurative irons in the fire, but our dedication to, to each continues. Currently, we are assisting Cal Fire with the wildfire near Kirkhoff Lake, which is now 108 acres and 60% contained. We are also still searching for Sandra Johnson Hughes in the Sierra National Forest near Ch uh, Ch How'd we say that? <laughs> Ch Highlight it. Chiquito. 
Yeah, Chiquito. Sorry. <laughs> uh, near Chiquito Lake, Tulare, Fresno, Marip- uh, Mariposa, Kings, Santa Clara, and Marin County all have joined our search and rescue operations. Cal OES is providing communications, and California Air National Guard is assisting with aerial searches. Now, this is a post from Ashley, and this gets into the sleeping bag. Ashley posted to Facebook, search efforts are ongoing and teams are following up on leads as they are discovered. Her sleeping bag was found approximately 2.5 miles north of her car, just inside Yosemite National Park. So this is near the Spotted Lake area where they found it. It's a very difficult area to get to as there are no main roads in or out. Searchers had found the sleeping bag and said it looked as if some had been recently used. Um, After the discovery of the sleeping bag, searchers combed the area of Spotted Lake but didn't find any additional evidence of uh, Sandra. Did you find the lake? Yeah, this is, I mean, this area is super rugged. Yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, at first I thought she was hiking the whole way. It seemed like she was taking her car and trying to move up to Yosemite. So she was going that way, and that's what she wanted to do. But it's still at some pretty rugged areas unless there's some back road stuff that i'm unaware of which there might be now the map that had the markers located um that obviously i want to just confirm that here's spotted Spotted lakes yeah right there spotted lakes okay so it was uh west of there so So like around this yeah this area okay i can narrow down a little bit yeah so rivers going in there so yeah they uh and they said the sleeping bag looked like it had been recently used so that adds even more intrigued to the case um and we'll get into theories but i mean this one is puzzling and it it, the discovery and the the discovery of the sleeping bag and the the lack of additional evidence really puzzled searchers as her original campsite car crash and sleeping bag were all more or less in a straight line north um and at this point she would have been slowly hiking north without any gear food and possibly shoes and maybe an injury from the car crash. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're talking uh, campground, or ca- her campsite. Her car was found six miles north. Sleeping bag's another two and a half miles north. I, You know, that's, and this is rugged terrain. Rugged, remote, isolated terrain. Um, ooh, what are you reading there? Uh, just uh, like kind of the stuff that you're saying. Okay. So this is Ashley Mackis's updates. Oh, yeah, and the, the sheriff's department, I think, actually copied and pasted some of this and posted it in one of their posts. Okay. Um, but some of the dates don't Yeah, that's where I'm seeing up. some of them are, aren't the so, same. So. Like I said, I, I'm going off the official statements from yeah. the sheriff's department. No, that, that's good. Um, and I'm not knocking anybody in the family for what no, they posted. Yeah, they're, they're disheveled. That was they're, the heat of the moment. Exactly. Um, it, it, and a lot of them are like a day off. Yeah, it doesn't really change, yeah. like I said, the narrative of the timeline. Yep. Uh, so it's now uh, July 13th of 2020. We have another Sheriff's Department update. Uh, they posted, as the search for Sandra Johnson Hughes continues this Monday morning, we are joined uh, daily by other agencies today. California Air National Guard in Fresno sent their UH-60M Blackhawk heli- helicopter crew to assist. I think they had a video of it landing. Nothing uh, yeah. crazy, but it gives you an idea what... They're using and we've all. This is a real long time for a search to be going, probably because they kept sawing, seeing signs of her. Yeah, I mean, they found her yeah. car and then they found a sleeping bag. And, and knowing mean, her background, mm-hmm. a lot of times they'll extend it because a lot of times after a couple of days they'll be like, "It's been a couple of days," but knowing yeah, I mean, she's in survival and being July, it's yep, it's theoretical. You know, it's not January. It's theoretical. You could probably survive out there. Yeah, with limited gear, assuming the weather is. Nice. Sure. Um, and I didn't get any indication of my, um, I mean, based on the pictures, everything we've seen, no snow on the ground. Um, it looks sunny. Um, it probably gets pretty, pretty hot. Yeah. I think that so. Time of year, but yeah, there's a lot of tree cover though. A lot of tree cover, um, water. I mean, there's water in the area that she yeah. can get access to. The problem is as we get into these other sightings is food. Um, mm-hmm. you can't survive for 30 days without food. Yeah. Um, so so we it, we're fast forwarding now to July twentieth of twenty twenty, and this was when kind of the search was officially scaled back. So we have a statement from the sheriff's department. Uh, after two weeks of continuous searching for missing missing person Sandra Johnson Hughes, 
using mutual aid assets from all over the state as well as the Air National Guard for helicopter and overflight reconnaissance of the area. MCSO has <clears throat> released all assisting assets and will continue conducting uh, the search of Sandra through investigation and follow-up on tips. We're asking anyone hiking in the Ch Chiquito Lake or Chain Lakes Basin just inside Yosemite National Park border to please keep an eye out for Sandra. If you see her, please try to make contact and document your coordinates with GPS. Immediately contact the Madera County Sheriff's Office or Yosemite National Park Rangers as soon as possible. So at some point, as any of you have listened for a while, the search has to get scaled back. Can't indefinitely expend resources um, but they, this one kept going as they found new evidence. So a uh, pretty long search, a uh, pretty, pretty big search. Um, but here's where things start getting interesting. So we have two more sightings. One, I would say possible, but not likely. And another one that seems just X-Files territory. Okay. <laughs> so our first sighting happens uh october 9th of 2020 so all you know over a month from when her abandoned campsite was found so hughes was reportedly spotted again on august 9th 2020 when two hunters told officials they saw a woman leaning against a tree along road 5 so1 near uh, bisho road road 5 so1 and bisho road are in the area of the chiquito creek near uh, portuguese overlook they mentioned to law enforcement that she did not wave them down, attempt contact, or appear distressed. The hunter said Sandra appeared to be visibly thinner than in her last known photos. She also appeared to have no equipment or other people with her. MCSO once again went out to the location of the reported sighting but didn't find any evidence that Sandra had been there. These sightings reportedly took place not from the not far from the areas where uh uh, where burned in the, uh, sorry, these didn't take uh, place far from areas that were burned in the massive Creek fire, which began Labor Day weekend of 2020 in Fresno and Madera counties. The fire was not considered fully contained until late December that year. Um, law enforcement officials go on to say her car did not burn in the fire and we have since gone up there and removed it. So her car had been sitting out there for, it sounds like over a month hoping maybe that she would return to it. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another sighting or another post from Ashley. Also, she wrote uh, Sandra Johnson Hughes was spotted this past Sunday, August 9th, 2020 along road five S O one near Portuguese Creek in Madera County, California. She was wearing overalls and a floral shirt. The gentleman that saw her said she appeared thinner than in pictures, but was standing by a pine tree drinking water. So now we have, if this sighting, is true. So I didn't, I considered the July 4th date, her kind of real date of when she went missing. And a lot of the media, I think kind of is going with that date. Mm -hmm. I think this sighting, while I don't know how, you know, I don't know much about it and I don't know how valid this sighting is. Yeah. Um, could it have been her? I think theoretically it could, but that would be a stretch. Uh, if she was out there on her own with no gear, no food, possibly injured to survive that long. Yeah. And then not ask for any assistance if two hunters saw her. So this this sighting is just puzzling to me. Sure. But it's not even the strangest sighting. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, we're, so fast forward an entire year now. So it's uh, July 21st of 2021. Uh, Jake and Victoria Gorba traveled to the Sierra National Forest with their three children when they decided to stop uh, to have lunch, um, stop to have lunch, and their son started talking to someone or something uh, off in the meadow that they were near. They were heading to Shut Eye Peak, which is about five miles south of Johnson Meadow Meadows. Uh, her parents said he was just in our car and he was pointing out to a certain spot in the meadow. He goes, "Yeah, there's a lady over in the meadow in a black shirt," and I got goosebumps. He says. She needs our help, but she's dead, and she's laying face down with her legs up, and she can't talk to me, but she's over there. We need to go help her. Um, so Victoria said Caden, which is her son, kept pleading for her to trust me, Mom. So she was 
spooked enough to venture into the field, hoping she wouldn't find a dead body, which Caden described right down to her blue hair. Not finding anyone in the meadow, they turned around and went home and posted their story to Facebook. Later that night, the sheriff's department somehow came across that Facebook post and contacted the family to further investigate, um, especially since some of the photos that Sandra Johnson Hughes uh, they had were in a black shirt and blue hair. So Joe actually has a news clip from um, that time period with Yeah, if you're report. watching, you'll see it. Otherwise, you can hear it, and I'll be fine. You got the uh, volume up. We turn now to a yep. family vacation that took a strange turn in California. They visited the same area where a missing woman was last seen. ABC's Andrea Fuji picks up the story from there. This morning, a California family's ghostly encounter could help solve a mystery. When the Gorba family went on a four-wheeling trip in the Sierra National Forest, their three-year-old son, Caden, started talking to someone who wasn't there. He was just in our car, and he was pointing out to a certain spot in the meadow. The family was at Shut Eye Peak, about 70 miles outside Fresno, when they stopped for lunch. Mom, Victoria, says Caden told them there was a woman close by. I got goosebumps. He says... She needs our help, but she's dead. And she, um, she's Jeez. laying face down with her legs up. And she can't talk to me, but she's over there. We need to go help her. Caden's parents checked out the meadow, but saw nothing. He kept saying, trust me, trust me, Mom. And I was like, I trust you, bud. You know, I believe you 100%. Creeped out, the Gorbas said they headed back home. Caden's mom then posted their experience on social media. And that's when the Madera County Sheriff's Department reached out for more information. Turns out a woman went missing just over a year ago within five miles of where they were. A woman with a black shirt and blue hair. He describes down to blue hair. He said she has a black shirt, blue jeans, and blue hair, Mom. Detectives say Caden's description matched that of 53-year-old Sandra Hughes, who went missing in June 2020 after going camping alone. Caden was able to identify three out of four pictures of her. Detectives went back to the meadow with the Gorba family to investigate, and so far found nothing. But the case remains open. If she was possibly a ghost looking for some help, I hope that he could have at least helped and maybe help the family Mama. find her. That four-wheeler the family used <laughs> to drive up to the meadow is now for sale. <laughs> they say they're too spooked to use it again. Mona, Victor. Andrea. So, spooky and yes. bizarre. I have my theories on that whole incident. We can get into it at the end here. Um, I'm sure you do, too. <laughs> I have lots of theories. So... We'll just jump right into theories because that's kind of where the timeline ends. I mean, this is a very recent case that that story we just listened to from the news clip happened just uh, July of last year. Uh, so we'll start what law enforcement think happened. Uh, authorities state at the end of the search that they have no evidence or indication that Sandra suffered a serious injury or anything worse. Um, they they went on the quote. Uh, they said she has very good experience in the wilderness and sustaining herself in the wilderness. So the only appropriate thing is to assume that she is alive and to keep searching for her. So towards the end of the search, they were pretty confident that based on all of the sightings that she was still alive. Sure. Um, so, you know, family, uh, I didn't really get a good pulse on what some of the family were thinking, but there were a couple good theories I found online that I just wanted to to go over quick, and then Joe and I will jump into what we think would happen. Um, so this first theory came from somebody online and it goes into kind of what we've maybe touched on in past episodes with, you know, this was COVID was just kicking off. Um, it, you know, a lot of people had their world shaken by it. No one knew really in the first couple months what was going on, how severe it was, how deadly it was, all that kind of stuff. So this poster wrote, and now this is a quote from their theory. Uh, I think she was going through through some problems or having a mental problem. The campsite wreck sighting and sleeping bag in Yosemite don't show normal behavior, but I don't think her behavior was the result of a concussion. I found it interesting that she moved around frequently. She had also changed her hair to blue recently. She did, didn't appear with blue hair in any other, any of her pictures. COVID had just struck and she decided to go camp to me. She could have been suffering from something undiagnosed. I wonder if she became so afraid of COVID that she became afraid of everyone uh, it could be why she refused to help, refused help or ignored people. 
I also think she may have been suicidal. All of the irrational behavior on her camping trip could be a sign that she wanted to get away from others uh, to end it all. The other thing I think could have happened is that she had some something undiagnosed. She may have went camping with the intention of coming back but suffered a debilitating episode that she couldn't snap back from. Uh, other theories were that the car crash caused her confusion. Um, one person who was on the actual search and rescue thinks she may have stumbled upon something illegal. Um, this poster wrote, I was part of the search a couple weeks ago. I've been hiking that exact area for a lot of my life, and I know it really well. There's a lot of places she could have ended up, and it's easy to get lost around there, but so much of this case is just bizarre. I started thinking it's possible she stumbled upon a grow-up and was disappeared, and the crash and sighting were both a cover-up or something. There have been quite a few grow-ups in the area over the years. Wouldn't surprise me given the nature of her campsite and where her car was. Now, other posters, when this guy said this, that that really goes against uh, – the grow ops, like they usually want to low stay, profile, low profile. If someone stumbles across it, they just kind of disappear into the woods. Mm-hmm. They're not going to kidnap someone, kill them and then set yeah, up, bring attention and law enforcement. To yeah. The you're area. bringing hundreds of people into where you're growing illegal, you know, things. So yeah. I don't know how theoretical that is. Okay. Um, others have a very more simple explanation that she went missing in her camp and car were just ransacked by random people. Cause it might've been there for a few days. Uh, and then, yeah, the final theory I read was just, you know, going off the theme of she was lost. Uh, they wrote, uh, this is about 30 minutes from where I live. Parts of the sea are very rough terrain, rocky as hell and dry this time of year, in addition to being somewhat spooky area, in my experience. According to one local news station, her personal items were found at Johnson Meadows. If she took the way in that I know through Fresno Dome, that's deep country, like narrow dirt road, no outlets, where was she? Uh, where she was was very, very remote and not a super popular area. So, she could have just got lost. And okay, it was yeah. Her. She'd recently moved to California. Was not familiar with the and you know location that map. You look how remote. Yeah, and uh, you know, just you could easily get lost and not be found there. Sure. So, um, what do you think happened? <laughs> so, I don't know. I. So there's there's a couple different things I've gone through my head. I would say if all of the sightings are accurate, let's just, let's start with there. All every sighting is a real sighting. And yeah. the only reason I give credence even to that last one is because she did have survival skills. Yeah. And you could theoretically live for a month in the woods if you had water. Yeah. That would not be an issue. Um they said she looked skinny uh compared to the other pictures. Uh that makes sense. Um I would agree almost with that first commenter's theory. Yeah. Um, she seemed to have maybe gone through some sort of mental thing. Um, and just because a lot of people did. I know people that were, you know, just fine and all of a sudden this happened. They became hermits. They kind of, yep. they and like to this day still are. Think of a Howard like, Stern. Yeah, like a, a, a switch flipped. And so, so she, yeah. yeah, I don't know why they would make her, maybe she just wanted to dye her hair. That doesn't have to do anything with it. Yeah. But she made a bunch of changes. You know, yeah. she moved. She made a bunch of changes that were out of the ordinary, potentially, and she was acting erratically. Um, so that all makes sense. You know, if her campsite was like her car, did she just, is she just throwing, like, you don't know, like it could be, she just kind of lost it. Yeah. And her, her basic survival skills and instinct are still kind of working. Yeah. In the, in, you know, behind the scenes. So she's able to continue surviving, but just not in a good state. Yeah. I think that's a very plausible theory. Um, the theories where the second sighting is not her, maybe it's just someone that kind of looked like her that was skinnier. Um, or they're opportunistic. Yeah. Yeah. They want to get in the news. Yeah. That could be too. But even if, if let's say that one's not legit and they thought it was, yeah. um, then she may be missing in that area and they just didn't find the body. Yeah. And that's kind of what I'm thinking about. And now the reason why the things are strewn about, you could argue the same thing. Maybe she, you know, crash a car, hit her head. She's not bleeding, but has a concussion. Yeah. Uh, maybe that caused it. And then you're going to be very erratic and then mix in. If you don't have the right gear, mild hypothermia from a bunch of nights in the wilderness, even in summer, you know, not having proper food, proper water, proper anything. Yeah. Um, I think those are the two most plausible. Uh, I, I think the grow operation would be more of the, 
Hollywood version. Yeah. It doesn't uh, line up with what we've read about those operations. Like we said, they don't want to yeah. be found. Off the deep end, um, I was reading some of the comments in, in Ashley's post about spirits oh, yeah. and and paranormal activity because uh, – and that's what's funny. A lot of people think that, so I don't know if that's just tales they tell in the area, but there's a lot of paranormal activity A lot associated. of locals think it's, like, haunted. Exactly. So that's, yeah. to me, off the deep end is uh, – is Some kind of some, paranormal. Yeah, ghosts or whatever, and then that kid summoned whatever energy – yeah, that she's involved in. Like that to me is the off the deep end stuff. Um, now theories about that kid. I don't know. I could have got lucky, and it's just a three year old saying stuff. Three year olds yeah. do say we- weird things sometimes. Uh, that could be the parents wanting to get their fifteen minutes. Uh, yeah, I'm not gonna say one's correct and one's not. Yeah, that one just is very sketchy to me. Um, it could be. Yeah, they read about it. I mean, it's a year later after she went missing. They could have coached. That actually makes it less likely it was faked by the parents, in my opinion. Maybe, yeah. Why would you wait a year? Yeah, unless they're really smart about it. Yeah. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean. A th- so, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, a three-year-old is not going to lie on their own about something like that. Yeah. Unless they were coached by their parents to say. But you would think investigators, I'm assuming they talk to the kid. Yeah, or or not, or who knows? Who knows? It'll be like Balloon Boy. I think we can kind of write off that sighting as who the hell knows? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like I don't know. Yeah, that's so strange. Like, but I think I think you're onto something with. I think she had her campsite set up and she got in her car to do something and crashed. Yeah, and injured herself. And she like she had a bruise on her face. Maybe she had a severe concussion. That's kind of what made me think that is like they She's didn't find there. blood in the car. Yeah, but if you're not wearing your seatbelt and you hit something at 20 miles an hour, it's not a small thing. Well, think like her if her airbag didn't deploy and she just hit her head on her steering wheel at yeah 20 miles an hour, like you can get a concussion from that. Yeah, and I mean not hard enough to deploy the airbags, but you can get a concussion from your airbag. Yeah. So even if it did deploy. So I'm thinking maybe she, for some reason, cra- maybe like an animal ran out on the road and she swerved to miss it and hit a tree or went down the ravine or something. Mm-hmm. She got, maybe she got knocked out and then came to concussed like in a state of confusion. She started rummaging through a car. She had enough. That's actually a great point. Yeah. If she had like a syncopal episode, like um, I got a concussion in high school where I don't remember what happened afterwards, but they were yeah. telling me the stuff I was doing and it was very odd and weird. Yeah. So to your point, it could have been hard enough. You know, she's a little bit older. Yeah. More susceptible to injury. Uh, had a complete sinkable episode, wakes up and just like. And still in a but, state of confusion. Like, well, the, that's what I'm saying. Like you're, you're not in control of what your body's doing. So yeah. you're just going to be doing stuff. And maybe, yeah, she ransacked her own car and was kind of just throwing stuff out, maybe in a panic trying to mm-hmm. find, and then maybe remembered how to get back to her campsite. Did the same thing again. Was rummaging around. Um, yeah, just on like autopilot. Autopilot, and maybe she was kind of wandering around the Johnson Meadows area. That's when the hikers spotted her. Mm-hmm. And maybe what? Maybe she did pick up some of her gear because she was the, the hunters saw her in a different change of clothes. Yeah. So maybe she. Well, she had her back or her sleeping bag at a minimum. Yeah, she had her sleeping bag. Maybe she brought some food with her from the campsite. Yeah. And maybe she had a second bag or something with her to carry That food. would explain why she didn't ask for help if she was kind of out of it. Yeah. And acting weird and kind of like, uh, like not, Honestly, not knowing if, how to talk. If I if I would had seen someone like that on the trail, I would have probably followed them to make sure they're okay. Or like if we were in a group, like, all right, go get a park ranger. Yeah. This person's but That's also because of what we do and what we yeah. know. I mean, uh, she's I obviously think. obviously injured. I think most point. people would like look at her if they're acting weird, might be like, ooh. Stay away from that weird person, especially if you're local and you're, and there is crime in the hills. Yeah, and, you know, there's people in California. That but a middle aged woman who's got a bruise on her face, like, yeah. what if she's got an abusive spouse and she just got beat? Or okay. I mean, I, I don't know. I I'm think. Sorry, Mike, you're a better person than me. Yeah. <laughs> no, a lot of people in the comments said, you know, locals like they've come across tons of people that looked like they might need help. They say no. They're like, I go on my way then. Yeah. So. And who knows what I would do in that situation. But so going off that theory, maybe she, um, you know, she had enough sense to grab some stuff, maybe a change of clothes. And she, for some reason, like she had that idea in her head that she wanted to get to Yosemite. 
So she was going north. Yep. Just even though that's irrational because you said it was like what twenty but miles that's, away. At that point, like if you think about it, and I can be fact checked on this, but I would look at that as like that's base level function of yeah. in her brain. She had an idea of what she wanted to do. If her you know uh, motor skills are off and her critical thinking are off, but she still has that base in the back of her head of I was doing this. Her yeah. she might be that autopilot of like, like pre concussion plan. Exactly. Like this was the plan. So <clears throat> I'm just it's she's still going that way. Yeah. Just not, you know, doesn't have her faculties so, about her. So then maybe I the where I get hung up, I can see okay, she made it to where the sleeping bag was found. Mm-hmm. Um and they confirmed that was hers. Yeah. They knew for fact okay, so she was there. Yeah, they or at could, least her sleeping bag got some, there. Yeah, and then the strange thing is the hunter sighting is five miles south of Johnson Meadows. So did she now go from Spotted Lake south past her campsite again down five? You know, over yeah. the course of thirty days, that Maybe. doesn't make sense to well, me. Well, or it's I know there's stuff back that way. Yeah, I'm heading trying to head back to my stuff. That's what makes me question the sighting that the hunters yeah. had. You know, we'll never know probably if it was real. You know, like I would take if I saw something strange like that, because the reports were that she was like 15, 20 feet off the road, just like staring off into nothing, drinking water on a pine tree uh, with no gear, no one around her on a very remote road in the forest. I'd probably take a picture of her. Yeah, this is is. Then I then I can say like, I'm not making this up. Yeah, like, she was or there. A video and be like, hey, this is what I saw. This is what I even saw. Even if it's not her, then you yeah. have a video or a picture. Be like, oh, okay. there's somebody yeah. out in the woods there that might be injured or have a mental problem. Like the fact that they don't have a picture, they didn't take a picture of her. Like it's their word against you know ours. Mm-hmm. Is their sighting real or not? I tend to th- I'm going to go and say probably isn't, and she perished somewhere after she dropped her sleeping bag. Yeah. I just don't see how she would survive. That's the other thing. If she's coming back south towards the hunters, she's got to go through the search. Because they were out there for weeks yeah. searching with helicopters and they had dogs. And so they might have probably would have come across her. Or- so she hiked all the way to where her sleeping bag was found, injured with barely any food, no shoes, and then somehow managed the next 30 days go south five miles from her original campsite to be found by hunters, but not say anything. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. Yeah. That, that sounds unlikely. I think something, I think may, she, yeah, it sounded like the last sighting may have been, I think the, somebody else or something. I think the July 4th sighting was the last actual sighting of her. She was severely injured, like with a concussion kept going North and probably made it to where that sleeping bag was within a day or two of her sighting on the fourth and maybe she spent the night in it and then wandered off from it. And then never, you know, maybe she got lost again, injured and never will be found, or maybe she will be found in a few years. But I think that's the most plausible, um, scenario. Yeah. And yeah, deep end, I think paranormal. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's just the easy deep end to go yeah. to is the paranormal one. Um, but yeah, this is a real bizarre case. And, I want to know what the fans think. Yeah, let us know what you think. Um, I, I think it's we're probably overcomplicating it. I think if you factor in these weird sightings, the kid and the hunters, it makes it a lot more complicated. Yeah, I think if you just say like the the kid thing, maybe it, you know the kid was using his imagination, and you know who knows. Yeah, maybe he's heard about the missing woman. And then had a story about it. Like, I mean, he's a three-year-old kid. I, yeah, they just absorb the things that you don't want them to. In the hunter sighting, like, there's if there was more evidence that they saw somebody, like, a you know, picture or a video or something, I could believe it more. But I really think she probably hurt that sleeping bag. She's around somewhere in the wilderness where that sleeping bag was found. May never find yeah. her, but I think... No, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. Well... I want to hear everyone else's opinion. This is a one. this is a bizarre one. Some of them seem a little bit more clear cut. I think this one, because there's so many variables that get thrown into it, it's a little yeah. bit more difficult. So we definitely want to hear your opinions on this. And thank you very much for tuning into our show. We appreciate all of you for listening and sharing locations unknown with your friends and family. Be sure to like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, where you can find all the videos from each episode. 
Also, if you'd like to support the show monetarily, please visit our website or Facebook store to buy some sweet, sweet swag. Additionally, you can subscribe to our Patreon account, our YouTube subscription, and our Apple subscription where you have access to special events and additional shows for just paid customers only. Lastly, when enjoying the beauty of nature, whether backpacking, camping, or simply taking a walk, always remember to leave no trace. Thanks, and we will see you all next time.